Good morning, good morning. And if you're joining me, if you could please comment, that would be wonderful so that uh, I can see that you are able to hear me. Thank you so much for joining me this morning on this, the second Sunday of Lent. Um, next weekend, we will reopen our church um, due to various circumstances. Um, we had not been able to be open for the past uh, uh, few weeks, but next week we will uh, be open again for Mass with the proper um, distancing, of course. Uh, and so... Um, hope to see you all next week, 9 a.m. in English and 12 o'clock in Spanish. And are you able to uh, hear me well? Yeah, I can see everybody saying good morning, Lillian, Roger, and Erlene, and Debbie. I can see all of you. So say good morning, say hello. Thank you for joining me. And let, uh, let me know if you're able to hear me well, okay? Are you hearing me well? Please comment and let me know. And comment throughout uh, because that way I can have some interaction and, you know, put all of the different, if you like what I'm saying and, and if you're not. Uh, so uh, comment and let me know if you're able to see me. Uh, I mean, hear me. <laughs> Okay, so let's read the first reading for this Sunday. It's from the book of Genesis, chapter 22, the test of Abraham. After these things, God tested Abraham's faith. God said to him, Abraham, and he answered, here I am. Then God said, take your only son, Isaac, the son you love. Go to the land of Moriah. There kill him and offer him as a whole burnt offering. Do this on one of the mountains there. I will tell you which one. Early in the morning, Abraham got up and settled his donkey. He took Isaac and two servants with him. He cut the wood for the sacrifice. Then they went to the place God had told them to go. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey. My son and I will go over there and worship. Then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the sacrifice and gave it to his son to carry. Abraham took the knife and the fire. So Abraham and his son went on together. Isaac said to his father, Abraham, Father, Abraham answered, Yes, my son. Isaac said, We have the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb? We will burn as a sacrifice. Abraham answered, God will give us the lamb for the sacrifice, my son. So Abraham and his son went on together. They came to the place God had told them about. There, Abraham built an altar. He laid the wood on it. Then he tied up his son Isaac. And he said, Isaac. And he laid Isaac on the wood on the altar. Then Abraham took his knife and was about to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, the angel said, Abraham, Abraham. And Abraham answered, yes. The angel said, don't kill your son or hurt him in any way. The angel said, don't kill your son or, or hurt him in any way. Now I see that you respect God. I see that you have not kept your son, your only son from me. Then Abraham looked up and saw a male sheep. Its horns were caught in a bush. So Abraham went and took the sheep and killed it. He offered it as a whole burnt offering to God. Abraham's son was saved. 
So Abraham named that place, the Lord will provide. Even today, people say, Oh, the mountain of the Lord, it will be given. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time. The angel said, The Lord says, You did not keep back from me your son, your only son. Because you did this, I make you this promise. By my own name, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. They will be as many as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. And they will capture the cities of their enemies. Through your descendants, all the nations on the earth will be blessed. This is because you obeyed me. Then Abraham returned to his servants. Now the second reading for this Sunday. From the book of Romans chapter 8. So what should we say about this? If God is with us, then no one can be against us. God let even his own son suffer for us. God gave his son for us all. So with Jesus, God will surely give us all things. Who can accuse the people that God has chosen? No one. God is the one who makes them right. Who can say that God's people are guilty? No one. Christ Jesus died, but that is not all. He was also raised from the dead. And now he is on God's right side and is interceding for us. And the gospel from Mark chapter 9, the transfiguration. Then Jesus said to the people, I tell you the truth. Some of you standing here will see the kingdom of God come with power before you die. Six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and went up on a high mountain. They were all alone there. While these followers watched, Jesus was transfigured. His clothes became shining white, whiter than any person could make them. Then two men appeared talking with Jesus. The man were Moses and Elijah. Peter said to Jesus, Teacher, it is good that we are here. We will put three tents up here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Peter did not know what to say because he and the others were so frightened. Then a cloud came and covered them. A voice came from the cloud The voice said, This is my beloved son. I love him. Listen to him. Then Peter, James, and John looked around, but they saw only Jesus there alone with them. As Jesus and his followers were walking back down the mountain, he commanded them, Don't tell anyone about the things you saw on the mountain. Wait till the Son of Men rises from the dead. Then you may talk about it. While I was in the seminary, my very first pastoral assignment happened at Good Shepherd Parish in the little village neighborhood in Chicago. If you know anything about uh, Chicago, you will know that it is divided into different neighborhoods. And this was a heavily crime-infested area of Chicago with lots of gangs and violence. If you pay attention to the news at all, and go ahead and comment and let me know, you know, if you know what I'm talking about. You know all the gun violence that happens on the streets of Chicago, all the people that continue to die on the streets of Chicago. We think as, you know, people dying in Afghanistan or Iraq, but all the people, I mean, there's thousands and thousands of people who get killed on the streets of Chicago and other cities in our own country. Let's not just think of war as happening somewhere else, but it's happening in our own midst. And I was in this parish, and I will never forget talking to a teenage boy. 
And I asked them a very simple question. I said, what do you want to be? I asked them, what do you want to be when you grow up? And his answer continues to haunt me to this very day. He said to me, you mean if I grow up? If I grow up? That's an answer that he told me in the United States of America, not in Afghanistan, not in Iraq, not in El Salvador, not in Honduras. If I grow up, he said, as he faced the reality of unreal violence, where just by walking down the street, he could be shot and killed. And this violence continues to this very day in alarming levels where we continue to sacrifice and kill our children. We continue to sacrifice just like in the ancient world. We continue to kill our children. We sacrifice our children to drugs to addiction, to depression, to loneliness, to pornography, sex and suicide, the horrible effects of divorce and discord in families kill children. We kill them inside. Parents abandon their children for work. I remember when I first uh, moved to the United States and I used to And I used to wait on the couch waiting for my mom to come home from work. She used to work two jobs and I would wait for her to come home and I would just want to spend some time with her and I would watch her as she was sleeping in between jobs wanting some time with her. Seeing the horrible fights between my parents caused me immense stress. You know, my parents eventually divorced. You all know that my family broke up. There's no, no wonder that I, I had to go through therapy in my life as a result of that face why I ended up weighing 325 pounds, the psychological and emotional stress that killed me. And children continue to be sacrificed to this very day. You know, I will never forget the story of a little boy whose father comes home from work and, uh, and he's been working 14 hours this is very normal today, where you prefer your work to your family as if you were a cow with two stomachs. How many stomachs do you have? Can you eat with two spoons? No. How much do you need? The Bible says the more a person has, the more they will want. We don't need much. What we need is love and care. And this little boy is in bed already and he's been waiting all day to see his daddy and when the father comes into the room to see his little boy the little boy looks at him and says daddy you've been at work all day how much do you make an hour and the father says oh i make 15 dollars an hour and the little boy says well can i can you give me 15 dollars and the father says, all you want is money. He gets all angry with his little boy and says, all you want is money. And he gives him the $15. And the little boy gives it back to his daddy and says, daddy, could I buy an hour of your time? We continue to sacrifice our kids. Alcoholic parents and spouses believe in human sacrifice as they don't get any help for their addiction, not wanting to go into Alcoholics Anonymous and their alcoholism kills their spouse. 
You kill your family. You kill your children. Just look at the statistics. Alcoholics come from alcoholic families. It's not enough to say, I love my children. Anybody can do that. Words aren't worth the breath it takes to say them unless they are accompanied by action. Sexual abusers were abused themselves 99% of the time as children. I used to volunteer as a chaplain at Pelican Bay State Prison. I met many, many, many young men who became rapists and other things and abusers. And if you talk to them, they were abused as children. Cheaters come from families where they saw their parents cheat on, uh, on, uh, on each other. Those are statistics. Yet you say, I love my spouse. If you do change, if you love your children, you're going to change. This is Lent. Hello? I'm, I, who am I speaking to right now? Are we in Lent or are we not? Most of the people who perpetuate violence against others are believers in a God. They believe in God. And they undoubtedly believe in the God that we met in the book of Genesis this Sunday. Not the God I worship. Not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that is revealed today in the first reading. But they believe in the God that we hear about in the beginning of the story about Abraham and having to sacrifice Isaac. We continue to live in a culture that believes in a God who asks for human sacrifice. We are no, no different than the ancient world, like the Aztecs or the, or the others. We continue to kill each other in the name of God. Abraham was surrounded by ancient religions that demanded the sacrifice of children to their gods and thrived on human sacrifice. And Abraham believed that his God was unlike the other gods. But God reveals today that the God of Israel, our God, the one I worship and that I'm calling you, is this the God you worship? The God of Israel and we are the people of Israel, the new people of Israel, takes no pleasure in human sacrifice. He is a God of life, not death. I will never forget reading about Andrea Yates. Do you remember? Comment. Come on now. Are you, why aren't you all commenting? You remember Andrea Yates, the Texas mother who drowned her children, her five children? And when asked why she did it, you can Google all this information. What did Andrea Yates say? She says, God told me to do this. I did it for God, she said. Now, this is not the belief of a mad woman. It is present in our midst to this very day. How many parents kill their gay, lesbian, or transgender children? Because they believe in a God who wants these children to be sacrificed. And how do they kill them? By rejecting them, by shaming them. And many of these children commit suicide. Look at the statistics. Because, they, because their parents believe in a God or family members of these children believe in a God who doesn't accept their children. And that God created an abomination they quote the Bible. I mean, these are, these are like religious people. I mean, what kind of a God do you believe in? Who would ask you to sacrifice your children? And, and these fringe Christians, because that's what I call them, okay, believe in therapies. And there are, all, there are people who are even like present on my, on my Facebook who are, you know, so fanaticized. Their, their religion is their life. Not, not God, religion. And they believe in therapies to change a person's sexual orientation. And, you know, this is very common and it's, it's unreal. And they send their kids to centers where they are supposedly changed. Mormons, for example, have centers where they 
electrocute gay teenagers to try to make them straight. I mean, this is 2021 we're talking about here. The rate of suicide in these children is unreal. In the name of God, parents continue to sacrifice their children. Parents continue to kill their children, demanding that their children be perfect. Perfect students, perfect athletes, perfectly behaved. You need to do this or that. I want you to be better. The pressures that are put on kids today, the pressures we put on each other to be perfect. You need to be in this program, in that program, in that program. I will never forget when I was at St. Francis Solano in Sonoma as an as a parochial vicar starting out, and I was supposed to train altar servers, and we had all these kids to be trained for altar servers, and I'm looking to, uh, you know, have the kids uh, sign up for a time to train them, and the mothers take out the calendar. At this time, piano lessons. At this time, this sport. At this time, this meeting. At this time, horse riding. At this, I mean, these kids don't have time to be kids. The pressure to be perfect, to get the best grades, why is there so much depression and anxiety and killing in our, in our families today? Because these children have so much pressure on them. Take the pressure off. No, you say to your child, you are perfect just the way you are. I love you just the way you are. You know, if you get good grades, great. If you don't get good grades, that's fine too. I love you just the way you are. There's nothing that you could ever do that would ever make me not love you. Take the pressure off. The damage that my mother did to me psychologically, the killing, it's, a, it's an inside killing. A spiritual, emotional, psychological death. When she told me when I was growing up that no one would ever marry me. You will never find anyone, she said. Look at you. Have you looked in the mirror? Look how fat you are. No one will ever marry you. Do you know what that did to me? She killed me inside. And we continue to do the same thing with each other to this very day. We kill each other with our words. We continue to believe in a God who demands human sacrifice. Is this the God you believe in? I'm asking you right now, what is the God you believe in? I want some comments right here. Do you believe in a God who says, choose life and bring life to people? And yet the Bible says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Mercy, compassion, kindness, saying only the good things people need to say. Stop saying, I'm going to tell him the truth. Your husband's out all day long listening to the truth at work from other people. He needs love and kindness and acceptance. You know, when the Bible says, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect, and I put a video up on that explaining it. Perfection in the Bible is the word heset, which is the word for mercy, when God says, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect, he's saying, be compassionate. Perfection in the biblical sense is compassion. When I am kind, when I am merciful, when I accept people as they are, when I do not judge, then I am being perfect. Not that I am flawless. Stop demanding flawlessness and issueless. We are all sinners. We all produce caca. We all go on the toilet the same way. I will never forget being in the seminary and everybody was like, oh my God, oh my God. This cardinal was visiting from the seminary and guess who they chose to sit next to the cardinal? Because everybody was so scared because the cardinal is visiting. And all of a sudden, you know, I mean, I was really scared too. And all of a sudden at the, at the end of the meal, the cardinal uh, takes a glass of water and takes out his teeth. You know, he had uh, dentures and puts it in the water and starts cleaning his dentures and then takes out a toothpick and starts picking at it. And some, and I will never forget this. One of the professors, an older priest, he says, well, this just goes to show you even cardinals and popes put on their underwear the same way. We are all human beings in need of love and understanding and we see this right now in the midst of this pandemic, so much suffering, inside suffering. People have hard lives. Don't add more to it. 
The people who say, I don't want to receive communion on the hand because my hands are dirty. I only want to receive communion on the tongue. I am on the tongue. Which is more dirty in the human being? I'm asking a question right now and I want comments. What is more dirty in the human being? The hands or the tongue? It's the tongue that's more dirty. The hand is not more dirty than the tongue. You kill with your tongue. So stop with all these people who say, Father, you said about going to confession. Well, I haven't hurt anyone. I haven't killed anyone. I don't do this. I'm such a perfect person, you know. I don't have any sins, Father. Well, then let's take the statue of Mary down and put you up there. If you don't have any sins, we are all sinners. I'll never forget you know, walking through a, a grocery store once and I noticed that this lady who hadn't been to church in a long time and I, I, I look at her and I say, I haven't seen you in church in a very long time. And she says, oh, Father. She says, Father, I can't go there. There's all these hypocrites there. Church is full of hypocrites. And I say, well, don't worry. There's always room for one more. I mean, we are all in the same boat together. The minute you start beginning to think that you are better than your wife or that your wife has more issues than you or your husband or your kids is the start of going down because it is the start of pride. And God calls you to humility, to be humble. It's not that my husband needs to change this Lent. Who needs to change? You need to change. Stop with all of this. You know, the president needs to change. The church needs to change. The priest needs to change. You know, all these people need to change. My children need to change. My siblings, everybody needs to change except you, right? Mm -hmm. You don't need to change, right? No. This Lent is for, all, for other people, right? It's not for you. No, it's for me. I am the one who stands in need of change. You know, the... The person who believes that you haven't killed anyone, your words kill. Belittling people, making fun of people, making them feel like garbage, calling them names, giving people the middle finger. Okay, this one. <laughs> I always sometimes give people this one. You know what? Because I say, you know, they're not worth the other one. <laughs> so, <laughs> the little one. <laughs> okay, I mean, these making horrible comments on Facebook. I'm really shocked by some of your Facebook feeds. You think I don't know what you all, you know, did last summer? <laughs> you don't think I check your Facebook feeds? And the things you say to other people? It's unreal. How, why do you do that? Why do you bring people down? Why are you like that? You kill people. You, that's what you should really confess. Huh? You've killed your wife with your tongue and your husband over and over again, your children. In the name of God, I'm going to tell them the truth, Father. Is that how God deals with you? I'm asking a question right now. None of you are commenting, which really gets at me. Why isn't there more comments? Okay. Is this how God deals with you? the way you deal with your family members? I'm going to tell them the truth. The truth will set them free. What kind of an attitude is that? It's not a compassionate attitude. God wants compassion, mercy. Be ye merciful, and the merciful will receive mercy. We kill in the name of religion. We kill in the name of God. Not only that, we stone people with religion and commandments and rules. I don't want that type of religion. Do you all like my, my kind of Catholicism? I'm, I, you know, the, the version that I put out, a comment, if you like smiling and, you know, accepting and loving every single person. Do you like that type of Catholicism? We continue to profess a God who isn't love but a harsh and demanding God who demands perfection when perfection is compassion in the Bible and kindness. In John's gospel, I want to ask you all, 
do you know, you know this is uh, Pope Francis's favorite um, biblical story about the woman caught in adultery. Do you know that story about the woman who was caught in adultery and the religious people, <gasps> you know, are trying to stone her because she was sleeping around? Do you know that story? And most, and, and what do they say to Jesus, the Pharisees and the scribes and all the religious people? What do they say? Jesus, Moses said to stone a woman like this. And now remember, Jesus is the new Moses, okay? Because he brings people out of slavery, out of exile, out of the desert. So, and Jesus is God. In John's gospel, which is where this story of the woman caught in adultery is found, Jesus is presented as God. He, John is always trying to say Jesus is God because there were doubts in the early church about the divinity of Christ. So in the Bible, who writes with his finger? Come on now, all of you are Bible readers, are you not? Look, this is mm, the best. Mm, mm, okay, the Bible. All of you are Bible readers. Who in the Bible writes with his finger? I'm asking a question. God. And what does God write? The Ten Commandments. And how does God write the Ten Commandments? With his finger. What does Jesus do in the story of the woman caught in adultery? He writes with his fingers. Remember, Jesus uh, went down on the, on the ground. Google this if you don't remember it. And he writes with his fingers. Now Moses went up the hill and takes the Ten Commandments from the hill where God had wrote them. And when Moses gets to the camp, he catches the people in the very act of idolatry. And what does Moses do? He breaks the commandments and takes the stones that the commandments were written on and begins to stone the people. Moses stones the people with the commandments. He throws them at the people. He breaks the golden calf, golden calf with the commandments. You know, he begins to throw it at the people. He throws the commandments at the people. He stones the people with rules and commandments. That's what the first Moses did. Jesus is a new kind of Moses. He is not the one who stones people with the commandments. He says, stop it. As God said to Moses, God says, don't do this in my name. Stop stoning people with the commandments. Stop it. Now you understand why Jesus rewrites the commandments and says, love God with your whole heart and your whole being and your neighbor as yourself. And these commandments are not written in stone, says Jesus. They are written in your heart. We as religious people stone the divorced with commandments, making people who are divorced feel dirty because they made mistakes in their life. We stone gays and lesbians and transgender people with commandments. Those not married in the church, you don't belong with us. You're going to hell. How often we hear that from religious people, to hell with that type of religion. Sick and tired of that type of religion. Those who don't go to church or the unbelievers are made to feel like God doesn't love them and that they're going to hell. It's the commandments. Look at the way you dress. We call people names. God doesn't love you. You're bad because you use contraception, people are told. You're bad. You know, you're horrible because you don't pray and the stoning continues. The stoning continues to this very day. I have a friend, a very good friend of mine. Uh, we're very, very close. And uh, she is a transgender woman. And she belonged to a church in the community where she lives currently in. And it was a, I'm not going to say what kind of a church it was, but it wasn't Catholic, but uh, she was very heavily involved there. And when she came out, they told her, you know, quoting the Bible, of course. But, you know, even the devil, Jesus says, can quote the Bible to prove his own point. 
You know, all these people who are like, oh, the Bible says, the Bible says. Well, the Bible, you know, you, anybody can use the Bible. You have to take the totality of it. I've studied the Bible for 12 years. Not that I woke up one day, you know, because I went to Billy Bob's Bible College and got a certificate. And, oh, I'm this great big pastor now. And I have, you know, no. And so she was a member of this, uh, of a church, a, a prominent church in that community. And she was told, you're an abomination. God hates you, she heard. You don't belong here. And she was thrown out. And she says this very openly. And she was made to feel like God hated her. That's what we do to people all in the name of God and in the name of religion. Go easy on those around you. Don't stone people in the name of God. Stop stoning people in the name of God. What does Jesus say to the woman caught in adultery? Has no one condemned you? She says, no, sir. And what does Jesus tell her? Neither do I. Where does this go? Where does this come from? Well, it's the same word God uses when he releases people from the captivity in Egypt. Because remember, Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. And what does he tell the woman? Go, he says, and sin no more. Meaning, you know, stop missing the mark. The, the word sin is from the Greek hamarteon, which means, you know, like when you have a bow and an arrow and you, you miss the mark, Okay. So we all miss the mark. We're all sinners. So what Jesus is telling her, go and, you know, try not to miss the mark anymore in your life. It doesn't mean you're not going to, but try, because that's what we have to do. We try in life. But where does this come from? This saying, remember, Jesus is the new Moses. It's the same thing God said to the people who were exiled 40 days in the desert, and they were enslaved in Egypt. And what does God say as he releases the people of Israel from captivity? He says, let my people go. It's the very exact same phrase that God said to the woman. Go, you are freed. God releases the woman. You are set free. No one has condemned you, Jesus says, and neither do I. He looks at her. Now this is more powerful because God never looks at us when we are in our shame. Remember from the story of Adam and Eve? So he releases her from her shame. And she can now go because she has been freed from the shame. So let go of the shame. That's how I want to end this reflection with all of you. God loves you just the way you are. Don't allow anybody to stone you with religion. Don't allow people to stone you with their words. And don't stone people. What kind of a God do you believe in? I'm asking all of you. You know, we all long for one thing in this life. We all long to have God say our name with love. That's the one thing that I always try to do with all of you to treat you with a lot and lot, lots and lots and lots of love. In the Gospels of John, in the Gospel of John, the disciples ask Jesus, where does he live? And Jesus says, come and see. Let me show you where I live. That's the whole Gospel of John. Jesus showing the disciples where he lives. He wants to do the same thing with us. Show us where he lives. And look at Mary Magdalene on Easter Sunday, because we are headed right now to Easter. We are on a journey to Easter. We want to have a great, big, happy Easter, resurrection, you know, roll away the stone and become new people and rise with Jesus to newness of life. That's what we want to experience. Who wants that kind of an Easter? And on Easter Sunday, Mary Magdalene does not recognize Jesus. Remember that? And uh, she thinks it's the gardener. And what does he, Jesus say to her? What are you looking for, Mary? Who are you looking for? What are you looking for? And she says, I'm looking for Jesus. And what does Jesus say to Mary Magdalene on the first Easter? 
something I want each and every one of us to hear. He says, Mary. That's all he says. Mary. And she then says, Rabuni. Right? You know, he says it with love and she falls to her feet because she heard her name in love. And the only way God can say our name is in great love. And that's the way God wants us to say each other's names with great love and understanding and compassion. She heard Jesus say, I love you. And I want all of you to hear that right now. Those of you watching me right now, if you feel like you are not loved, I know that you are loved. And you know how I know that you are loved? Because I love you. You are very important to me. I wouldn't be taking my time right now if you weren't. If you feel like nobody cares about you, I care about you. And I have a, the heart of a priest, which means God cares about you. You are loved. You are wanted. You are special. You are mine. That's what Mary heard. All the beautiful and soothing and comforting words and phrases we all long to hear, she heard. That's the only way you will have a happy Easter. Ultimately, I am convinced that we are all looking for God to pronounce our name with love. Like the lady who lost her husband. She was married for 50 years. And she said, Father, the only thing I wait for is for you to come down the aisle of the church and to wave at me. The gestures, the smiles. People have such hard lives, you know. Why are we adding more to it? We all want to be loved and wanted. That's what it's all about. You know what the essence of the gospel is all about? God loves you. God loves me. That's all. That's the summary. You don't need anything else. God loves me just the way I am. <laughs> and for me to get it, that's the way I can have a happy Easter. When I get it that I am the beloved, beloved disciple. You know, the beloved disciple doesn't have a name. We think it's John, but he doesn't have a name. Why? Because you are the beloved disciple. Read the Bible and you will see that it's not John who is the beloved disciple. It's you and me. The beloved disciple doesn't have a name in the Gospel of John because it's your name. So right now, this Sunday morning, before we end this reflection, insert your name there. What is your name? Come on now, type it. Type your name and then type, I am the beloved disciple. The same thing in the Gospel today. God, the heaven opened and said, this is my beloved son. With him I am well pleased. I will never forget, you know, I was teaching um, a catechism to little kids and I was teaching uh, these little kids and I was telling them that they, they have a daddy in heaven, that God is their daddy. And one little girl, she always wanted to know who her daddy was. Her mother didn't know who she conceived her daughter with. It happens, you know. People, we're all human beings. And stop thinking you're better than anybody else. You're not. And you're not better than this mother who slept around. None of us are better than anybody else. And so this little girl, she didn't know who her daddy was. And I told them in the catechism class, I said, God is your daddy. Now the mother used to always say to her daughter, I am your father and mother. I am your daddy and your mommy, she used to always tell her daughter, I am. And that day, the little girl went home after the catechism class and says, she looked at her mother and she says, you're not my daddy anymore. You are not my daddy anymore. I have a daddy. Father Adam told us today in class that God is my daddy. I have a daddy who loves me who I don't have to pay $15 to in order to have his time. That's what will make you have a happy Easter, to get it that you are the beloved disciple, the beloved child of God. Read the Bible and you will see it, that it's not John who is the beloved disciple, it's you and me. 
The beloved disciple doesn't have a name. And the beloved disciple at the Last Supper rests his head on Jesus' breast. That's what I try to do when I pray. To rest my, my, my head on Jesus' breast. To put my ear to his heart. And to hear Jesus say, Come to me, all you who labor and find life burdensome. And I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus was a rabbi, you know, and rabbis, each of the rabbis had yokes that they put on their students. And we are all disciples. All of us are disciples of Jesus. We are his students. And Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Each of the disciples of a rabbi in the ancient times had to carry the yoke of the rabbi. And Jesus says, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Jesus doesn't lay heavy burdens on you heavy yokes on you. It's all light. So stop levying. Stop putting heavy burdens on people. To hell with a religion that burdens people. I want a religion that lifts people up. A faith that lifts us up. That gets us out of the gloom and the darkness. You know, we have traditionally assigned this role to John as the beloved disciple at the Last Supper. And Peter leans over to John and asks Jesus, asks John to ask Jesus. Remember that? He says, ask, Peter asks John to ask Jesus, who will betray him? Ask him. Peter asks John to ask Jesus. Now this is Peter, the one who, you know, will become the leader of the, of the group. First Bishop of Rome. And I wondered to myself, why doesn't Peter just ask Jesus himself? I mean, he's supposed to be the m most important guy, right? Why does John have to do it? I'm asking you right now. Why did John have to do this? Because power doesn't speak to Jesus. Only intimacy does. Only love speaks to Jesus. Not your position, but love. Lean on his breast. You understand that? The Pope cannot pray as Pope. He can only pray as Christ's lover and his beloved. I can only pray as Adam, not as Father Adam. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? As Jesus' lover, as his beloved, it's my intimacy that counts, not my position. So I bless all of you this Sunday. Thank you so much for joining me. Did you get something out of today's reflection? Next week, we will be open at 9 a.m. in English and 12 o'clock in Spanish. I will do Mass. Finally, we will be able to be reopened. Uh, all of you who are feeling down and depressed, the best way to deal with that is to do something. Bake something. Clean your house today. Do the toilets. Use Clorox. <laughs> do something. Make a meal for your husband. Cook for your kids. Take some cookies to your neighbor. You know, do something nice today for, for each other. Uh, go ahead and comment, everybody. Did you get something out of today? Did, you, did, it, did it help you at all? I want to see some comments right now. And did you share the feed today? The, did you share it? Go ahead and share it. Click the share button. Okay. Hello. Hello. Okay. Wonderful. The, okay. I'm seeing every Sherilyn. I'm seeing all of you come. I want some comments here because, you know, this took me many, many, many days and many, many hours to prepare what I had for you today. Did you get things out of it? Okay. Love how you preach, Father. You say it like it is. Well, that's good, isn't it? Okay. Did it help? In any way? No, I want you to comment because, you know, some of you, you, you're, you join, but, you know, you don't say anything. And, you know, I'm a human being. I need some encouragement too. Hi, Mona. Hi, Diana. Hello, hello, everybody. Come on now, say hello. I want to see that everybody says hello, but uh, I need some you know, and any write to me and tell me what is it that you want me to uh, reflect about, okay? What is it that you want me to 
uh, talk to you about, okay? Like, uh, what are some things that you need? And I'll get some good news from the Bible for you, okay? So, hopefully, you know, I always, always try to um, find some good news for you, for your life, and, and some life applications with some, pers with some um, examples, do you like the examples? Do you like the fact that I use examples? I always try to have some things, you know, to clarify. There's a reason why Jesus spoke uh, using parables, okay? So, hello, Tony. Hello, hello. Oh, okay. Did every, did, was everybody uh, able to hear everything well, the whole reflection that I brought in today? Hello, Corinne. Hello, 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 Marion Burns. Oh, my God. She's like the best dressed lady ever. Okay. Look fabulous, everybody. Take a nice shower today. I took my weekly shower, but I don't have any hair gel. I ran out of hair gel. I got to go shopping. Okay. So I like to look fabulous. It's wonderful to look. I, I learned that from um, my grandmother. She loves looking fabulous. Oh, she just got her second shot. I remember I posted it, so she's super excited, okay? Um, when I was growing up, uh, we, I used to have to take, we, uh, we, used, we always used to say, we need to take our weekly bath, whether we needed it or not. <laughs> Use perfume, look fabulous, go take a walk, okay? Please share the, um, the share the, reflection you don't know who in your life needs it okay okay marcy says i love when you talk about issues of anxiety and depression and fears and how to get rid of those thoughts well the bible is full of that that's why i always bring it up because i think it's a big issue today don't you yeah i'm reading a really interesting book i'm rereading it it's called finding ophelia uh you know but I got a long road ahead of me, but I don't know how to help my son. Please have him in your prayers. I will. What's his name? Make sure you send me your, your, um, make sure you send me your kids' names so I can pray for them. You know, put their names, put their names down, please. Okay. I want to know your kids' names. My grandmother is doing well. She had COVID. Did I tell you that? Did you know that my grandmother had COVID? Yeah, but you know, and she's got all the medical conditions in the world. She has asthma, heart disease. She has a pacemaker. She's got everything you could ever imagine. And she beat it. She lost 27 pounds, but she beat it. So it's, you know, absolutely wonderful. Oh, I posted um, Julian of Norwich, a picture of her, my favorite saint. She's a 14th century mystic. And I have a picture with her and her cat. And somebody was asking me, how come, how come there's a picture with this saint with her cat? Because she was isolated. This was a time during the bubonic plague in Europe when one third of Europe, Europe's population was wiped out by the plague. And the nuns were isolated. And she lived in isolation. And the only thing she had was her cat. That's why she's always... Um, pictured with her cat. Don't we love our animals? Yeah, we love our animals. Who loves their pets? Comment with the name of your pet so I can bless your pets. We love our pets. What would we do without our pets? Come on, everybody. Pets, pets, pets. You know, they bring you so much love, don't they? Okay. Comment with the names of your pets. I want to see the names of your pets so I can pray for them. Oh, thank you, Julie. Yeah, go ahead and say, uh, how many people love their pets? Absolutely, we love our pets. So pets are very important. We need pets in our lives. It's a great way. You know, they give you a purpose, gets you up in the morning. How many people are depressed? And, and if you have um, a pet, it's a reason for you to get out of bed. Go take them for a walk. Isn't that fantastic? Absolutely. Did you hear about, listen, did you hear about the lady who wanted um, a, a baptism for her cat? Did you hear about it? 
Did you hear about the lady who went to her parish priest and she says, Father, I want my cat to be baptized. And the priest says, well, you know that we do not baptize cats. And she says, but Father, I will make a $10,000 donation to the parish. <gasps> oh, well, now, now that's a different story. Let me see. Let, and he called the bishop and he says, Bishop, there's a lady who wants her cat to be baptized. And the bishop says, why are you calling me with such a silly question? You know that we do not baptize cats. We don't baptize animals. We only baptize human beings. And the priest says to the bishop, but bishop, you know, uh, she's going to make a $10,000 donation to the church. And the bishop says to the priest, he says, well, now, that's a different story. Don't just baptize the cat. Get him ready for confirmation. <laughs> Did you hear that one? Did you ever hear that one? <laughs> or did you hear about the lady who wanted a funeral for her dog? Did you hear about the lady who wanted a funeral for her dog? And she goes to her parish priest and she says, Father, I want a funeral for my dog who passed away. And he looks at her and he says, Now, how dare you? You know that we do not do funerals for dogs. But Father, I'm going to make a $5,000 donation to the parish. And the priest looks at her and he says, You should have told me from the beginning your dog was Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> I heard these many times and they still crack me up. I've got other ones, but they're a lot more colorful and I, I just, you know, I can't, uh, um, I can't uh, share them with you. Oh, by the way, you know, I mentioned Moses today. Moses, do you know how Moses makes his coffee? Do you know how Moses makes his coffee? He brews. He brews. <laughs> anyway, keep smiling, everybody. Life is tough as it is. You know, laugh a little. It's good to, uh, it's good to laugh. It's good to have a sense of humor. God wants you to have a sense of humor. I know when he looks at us, I'm sure he has a sense of humor. Do you know what the oh, Isaac, the, the name Isaac means? Remember uh, Abraham's son, Isaac? What does the name Isaac mean? I'm asking a question. It means he who laughs. He who laughs. So when God gives you a gift in life, he, he wants you to laugh. He wants you to smile. Oh, a priest, a rabbi, and a monk walk into a bar. I have a lot of those... Um, I have a lot of those, but you know, I really, I can't share with all of you, okay? I can't share many, I, at least not on here. You'd have to be in a personal thing, like if you go on a pilgrimage with me, and those of you who've been on pilgrimages with me, you know that I tell a lot of jokes, a lot of jokes, but everybody has to promise, they have to sign a disclosure that what happens on the pilgrimage stays on the pilgrimage. It's like Las Vegas. What happens in Vegas <laughs> stays in Vegas. It's like if you go on a trip with me, what happens on the trip stays on the trip because there's too many very, you know, religious people, you know, who, anyway. <sighs> Do you know what the word religion means? It's from the Latin religare. It means to enslave. Uh, to bind you. Jesus frees us. I feel free. Don't you feel free? You know, I mean, I feel absolutely free. God loves me the way I am. You know, my life is absolutely beautiful. The only way, you, do you know what the fear of the Lord is? You know, the Bible says the beginning of all wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Do you know what that is? It's not that I should be afraid of God or fear God in the sense that we think of it. But fear of the Lord means I, am, I don't want to hurt God. Do you understand that? I don't want to hurt him. Because if you really love, if you really love God, you don't want to hurt him. 
So the beginning of everything has to be that you fall in love with God. When you fall in love with God, you're going to act the right way. But first you have to fall in love with him. So you don't go on with commandments because, you know, commandments, they, you know, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. It, it goes together, all of it. Okay, I think I'm talking too much. My throat is dry. I got to, um, I have to, uh, I have to, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, remojar. How do you say remojar in English? Uh, my Spanish is kicking in. I'm forgetting my English right now. I have to uh, uh, moisten, moisten. <laughs> no, I'm using water. Stop it. Stop it. Don't go on saying, you know, fathers, they're drinking. <laughs> I probably sound like I've been drinking too. <laughs> have a good Sunday, everyone. Love you all. Mwah, mwah. God bless you. Share the video. Spread love. Life is beautiful. Bye. Hello, hello.